is a 2008 World Champions of Baseball. The Philadelphia Eagles are Super Bowl champions. Eagles fans everywhere, this is for you. Now entering the game for Philly Press Box Radio, Bill Furman and Jim Chet Chesko. It's Wednesday, March 15th, 2023. Welcome to the Philly Press Box Radio Roundtable brought to you by the Irish Rover Station House in Langhorne, PA, Allstate Insurance in Westchester, PA, and the Edge of Philly Sports Network. I'm Bill Furman. I'll be your host tonight, along with my partner, Jim Chet Chesko. Hey, Chet, spring training is moving along, so there's plenty of Phillies baseball to talk about. You'll even uh, you'll be in Clearwater this weekend. Go figure. The Eagles in the NFL free agency has been crazy. Uh, the price you pay for making the Super Bowl, I guess, is hurting the Eagles. The Sixers have now won five in a row. They're sitting in third place, one game behind the Celtics for the second spot. The Flyers have now lost, oh boy, 12 of 14. Uh, But they do have a new general manager, Danny Briere. We'll talk about that. But this season can't end soon enough. No Philly teams made the college basketball big dance, but Penn State's Nittany Lions did. Jed, I know you're happy about that. Plenty to talk about on the Philly sports scene. Well, yeah, you're right about the Flyers, uh, Bill. Good luck, Danny Briere. Uh, As for hoops, yeah, good to see Penn State back in the big dance for the first time in more than a decade. And NFL free agency week is always crazy. The Eagles did manage to retain a few of their big names, Fletcher Cox among them, the latest, uh, but also said goodbye to a few as well. We will talk about all of that, Bill. Yes, we will. Hey, we've got uh, a great guest tonight, first-timer joining us, uh, in former Philly shortstop Steve Jeltz. Uh, I can't wait to talk to Steve. Chet, you know I like former players because they have all the stories. And having met Steve uh, a while back, he's not shy about talking about the good old days. I promise this is going to be fun, Bill. Let's do it. Let's get rolling. Let's welcome Steve Jeltz to his first visit to Philly Press Box Radio. Steve, welcome. Well, thank you very much. How are you this evening? Great. Awesome. Hey, Steve, it was great meeting you back in uh, late January at that Darren Dalton fundraiser event in Norristown. And now we get to talk to you in detail about, well, a whole bunch of topics here on our show. Let's start with the fact that you were born in France. I looked it up. You were one of seven guys born in France, Bruce Bochy among the others, who played in the majors. Uh, that, that's pretty wild. A mil- military family, is that right? Yes, sir. My father was a... Uh... In the Army, 47 years of service, 27 active, 22 um, uh, or 20 uh, Army Reserve. You know, I learned how to pitch in a drill hall. I learned how to play basketball in a drill hall. I learned how to roller skate in a drill hall. So that was my (laughs) life growing up. (laughs) Well, how how did you uh, how did you finally get settled in to the point that you could be at one school or whatever or get get seen without bouncing around all over the country? Well, fortunately for me, we didn't travel around. Dad went and did what he had to do, and I was young enough. My brother was was seven years older than me, um, so they moved a little bit, and they were in Arizona and what have you. But when they landed in Lawrence, Kansas, that's pretty much where I was. Dad, I remember Dad leaving here and there, and I didn't really know what he did, but I found out he was a pretty important individual. So um, at his third retirement, uh, three five-star generals came to his his retirement in Topeka, Kansas. And that's what what brought tears to my eyes when I heard them talking about my dad. I said, wow, okay. He never talked about it. So, So, yeah, you grew up in Lawrence, uh, Kansas, went to the University of Kansas. Uh, 1980, we'll skip ahead to 1980, you're drafted by the Phillies. You made your MLB debut in 1983. You only played a few games. You got your first major league hit in 83. Do you remember that first hit? Yeah, Jerry Royce, wasn't it? Was it? I don't know. You yeah, tell line, drive, line drive down the right field line, triple was my first hit. Wow, nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, it's funny because you, we get you. I, I walked out there, I think, um, when I got my first start, actually, I had been taking a lot of ground balls and, and you know, fly balls out with Gary Maddox out in center field because I played everywhere on the field. So I just would go out and have, I had a blast. I was having fun the entire time. It's like I, you had a, 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 a 13 year old kid in veteran stadium running around is how I felt because I was having fun the whole time. So I, I started, got my first start. I remember Lefty came up to me and said, 
get your rest tonight, rookie. You're starting behind me tomorrow. So I had I'm standing at third base in veteran. I mean, at, at shortstop in veteran stadium, and my third baseman Pete or Mike Schmidt, Pete Rose is my first baseman. And Joe Morgan is my second baseman. Lefty yeah. on the hill, and Bo Diaz and Gary Maddox, Matthews. I think I'm not sure if it was Cisco Lascano or Tony Perez in right, but at 24 years old, you heard the names, and it's, you know where I'm at. I'm just I'm thinking, and I always played with with my brother. My brother was like the first Bo Jackson. He was. 6'3", 240 coming out of high school, had all the records in Lawrence, Kansas. They won football state championships, uh, basketball. He played. We only we didn't have a high school baseball team, so I played Legion ball, and they won championships there. But I always played with them, and they bounced me around pretty good. So, you know, being in Veteran Stadium with those guys, I didn't have that shock of it because I was always the underdog and I was always the little Steve and I got beat up and I got right back up. My brother used to snatch me up and say, you want to cry or do you want to go home? <laughs> so <laughs> I'd stop with that and I'd go, I'd start playing again. And then, you know, they taught me a lot. I was well ahead of the kids that were my age. So coming into veteran, veteran stadium with those guys around me, it was just, it was a blessing. I think I'll never forget after that first start, little Joe Morgan, called me over to his locker. He said, Jelsey, come here. And I walked over to him and and uh, he said, you know, I played with a lot of minor league rookies in my day. He said, you're the first big league rookie I ever played with. And so that right there just pretty much, I mean, you can imagine I'm 24 years old. And I hear that from Joe Morgan and we had a pretty good game that night. And and so, you know, it, it, it got my, I felt like I belonged there, you know, and, and then I had to learn how to how to hit in the number eight hole. I knew nothing about this pitcher hitting thing and all the, you know, I, I knew nothing about it. So I go up to the plate and I get a two and oh fastball with two outs and nobody on. And I get a fastball with the plate and I hit a line drive right at the second baseman for an out. And I'm thinking, oh, I did pretty good there. You know, I felt good about it. You know, I hit the ball hard. And Pete and Joe brought my glove out to me and they said, rookie, what the hell are you think you're doing? I said, if we wanted you to hit, you wouldn't be in that number eight hole. You got to <laughs> lineup. We got to get the pitcher out of the way. Now we start the inning with the pitcher and we play with two outs. You know, most likely I need to learn my role. So that that's what it is. When I hit first and second and, and seventh, you know, I did pretty well. But when you're in the eight hole, it, if there's a runner on base, you you go to, you go to swing and then they're not, pitchers aren't trying to throw you a strike with the pitcher come up. So you have to try and hit hit bad pitches. And then when you're when you're we have a man with nobody on and, and two outs and you're taking two and oh, three and one because on base percentage is the most important thing at that point. So, you know, it's it's a it's a strategy, but I think it, it kind of breaks my heart not seeing that that. I would li li like to have seen the DH disappear from the American League and make them start playing the game like that yeah, because it takes too. so much of the strategy out of it that I'm I'm just uh, – it's it, it it takes a lot of it out. I just – I learned how to play it, and it makes a lot of – a big difference when you're late in the game and the pitcher's coming up and he's doing well. Do you pinch hit for him? I mean, we, had, we had great growth, so, you know, are you going to – you're going to make that move or can we – can we – leave him in because we need him to, uh, you know, to keep pitching. So, I mean, that's, I mean, all that's gone from the game now. And I just, you know, that kind of, that I, I, that doesn't sit well with me. Right. Well, yeah, uh, out of that 83 team, you mentioned Pete, you mentioned uh, Joe Morgan, who was, who was the, the greatest mentor who actually took the time to spend the time with you? You know, all of them really did. I, I think would have been Sarge and, uh, Gary Maddox and and then I you know my locker moved right next to Mike Schmidt so Smitty and I talked quite a bit and and Smitty I I don't think people understand how great Mike Smith was either I you know I mean that entire team you can go from from the beginning to the end of that lineup and and on the bench and and that entire team they're just all great players you know I think Sarge you know he was I, I, you listen to what he had to say and and um and Smitty we used to sit and talk and that that pressure he had on him all the time you know that's Mike Smith I don't think people really understand that um, you know, they expect him to hit a home run every time he walks up to the plate, but it doesn't happen like that, you know? And, and so he was, he, he was a person that, that really thought that sometimes got in his head, his own head, like we all do, but I can't imagine being him getting in my head going, Oh man, what now? You know, and he's working on it and he's back in the cage and he's hitting. And I mean, he's working on off the tee and nobody bothers him when he's doing it, leave him alone. Except for me, because I, you know, I'm, you know, Steve. Steve just go and do what he does. But I just thought to him, I said, I said, I walked in the t in the back room and he was hitting off the tee. I'll never forget it. 
and he hadn't hit a home run in probably three weeks, four weeks. I don't know. It's been a while. And so incidentally, he, he, I stepped in the room at the right time and he was getting ready to hit off the tee. And I walked in between the, the his bat and the tee. And I said, Smitty, when's the last time you hit a ball out to right center? And he started to say something. And I put my hand up and walked away. You know, I said, I'll probably I'll leave him alone now. <laughs> he, might, he might chew me up now, but he didn't. And that night he went out and hit one on the, on the black tarp in veteran stadium in right center field. And he just came, he came down when he came back and sat down and he looked at me and, and I, you know, you're into the game. So, but these little things like that, I remember. And he just said, thanks, Chelsea. Cause I mean, it was like, you know, stop pressing and just, I'm having fun. He told me, he said, I said, Smitty, why are you nervous? Why are you, what are you thinking about? And he's on this, you know, he's thinking about who he is. I, you know, when I think about him, that's a lot of pressure and he did a hell of a job with it. And, and so I said, Smitty, I said, what's the matter with you? And he looked at me and he, I'll never forget it. He looked up at me and he said, he said, this is still the big leagues, right? <laughs> and I went, Ooh. you know, but for me, I mean, yes, I respected that and all, but I didn't ever, I mean, I, if I, I feel like how I teach these kids now, the number one thing for you to do right now is go out and have a good time. I said, the higher up you go, the tougher it's going to get, the harder you're going to have to work. And then if you do, by the grace of God, make it to professional baseball, and then you do make it to the big leagues, make no mistake about it. Every kid on this planet wants your job. So you got a target on your back when you get there. So you think it was hard to get there. Then you have to stay there. You know, so I, I was blessed. I stayed in the big leagues for eight and a half years and, and I had some pretty good teammates. I had a good time. Well, Steve, uh, I can't wait any longer. We got to jump ahead to June, 1989. You get asked about it all the time for yeah. people who don't know. It's uh, the, the legendary two home run game when the Phillies fell behind uh, quite a bit early. And uh, Jim Rooker made that famous comment. A lot of times during the course of the season, you'll score 10 or more runs in nine innings. And when it happens in the first inning, you're down 10 runs. You got a good chance to come back and win the ball game. But Pirates broadcaster Jim Rooker felt otherwise and led off the bottom of the first with a bold proclamation. Well, a leadoff double for Randy Reddy. Well, I'll tell you something right now. If we lose this game, I'll walk back to Pittsburgh. You'll have to. I won't have to, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> and then we know what happened later. For people who don't know, here it comes. Uh, more highlights of Steve Jeltz. Jeltz with a drive to right center. with a two-run homer. The Pirate lead is now 10-6. to six. Steve Jones gets only his third career home run. But the Pirates added still another run before the Phillies impromptu slugger once again came to the plate. And they will bring up Babe Ruth. Yes. Third time I came up, I had two men on uh, against Bob Kipper. Threw me a 2-0 fastball up and in. Drive to left field. Bonds is back to the warning track for the wall. It's gone. I don't even, I don't believe it. <laughs> the, hey, hey, Chet, I don't think you've even seen this, but see that baseball? Ah. <laughs> Whoa. 16, I did not know you had that, Bill. First Philly to hit home runs from both the left and right sides of the plate in a game in Philly's history, Steve Jeltz. How about that? There you go, Steve. That's something else. You know, it's funny that night. I, I wasn't even playing that night. And I think yep. um, I came down into the clubhouse. I've been up and down, up and down because the first half inning, 10 runs, it was forever. We changed pitchers two or three times. And I mean, it was forever. And so I, I went back up in the clubhouse for a minute and watched on TV, see if the umpire's calling pitches right or so. I'm just looking at things, you know, and I and so we finally get three outs. And then we they come in and I come down and I'm just this cheerleader, right? These guys aren't very happy coming off the field, but I'm playing cheerleader. I said, come on, let's go. I said, we got nine innings. I said, one here, one there, two here, two there. We catch these guys. We got nine innings. I said, so we can catch them. And, you know, I think Vaughn went deep in, in the first half or top of the or bottom of the first and and uh, just put us in a position where we pecked away all night long. And and uh, that that 
I would, like I said, I wasn't playing. Dickie Thon was uh, playing short, and um, uh, Tommy Hurd was playing second base. And after the first half inning, he got his at bat, and then um, he told me, Jelsey, go to second base. Well, you know, the guys were like, well, man, he can stick it out with us. And I said, man, this is the big leagues. I'm ready. Let's do it. I get to hit in the number two hole tonight. Oh, I'm loving this. Uh, you know, I don't get that. Uh, you know, when you're hitting the two hole, they don't want you on base because three, four, five coming up. So they're throwing to me tonight. I'm playing. Yeah. So, you know, I went out and then, you know, like I said, it was by the grace of God, everything worked out well. Good stuff. So, so Steve, uh, I, I got to ask you, like, is it pretty common for you to sign these balls? You know, I was down in Philly. You know, I got to tell you, I just got to say it out loud. I played in every, I played in the American League and the National League, of course, um, but I played everywhere. And I'm going to tell you right now, I grew up in Kansas City. I grew up in Lawrence, went to the University of Kansas, obviously. And, and, but I'm going to tell you, Philly fans, I, that's why I live here now. I, that's why I, I moved back. I was like, I had enough. I went through uh, 30 years of life and I said, you know, I got to go back. That's, a, that's where the happiest I ever was. And Philly fans are the best fans in the world. I'm telling you now, I, I, I've been everywhere, so I can kind of tell. But they're there, and they will get on your tail. People say, well, how, man, isn't it hard to play in Philadelphia? And I said, just play hard. I said, they're going to get on you. My dad was a command sergeant major, so, you know, that didn't bother me. But, you know, I said, they're going to get on you. But you know what? Just go as hard as you can go, and you'll be fine. And if they, if you're not, they'll let you know. If you're not, you guys will let us know. You know, that's, that's what I like about this area because my dad called it straight. So for me to play in Philly, I remember I had a game. I think we were down by – five or six and we had a pitcher come in in the ninth inning and and he got a, a, a base hit right away or double right away and and then he had one out and uh there was a ground ball hit and this is in the top of the night and we're down you know and so the fans are kind of sleeping on us right now because they're not happy about us being down by four or five or something i don't know but but we got one one out and and there's a, a man on second ground ball hit deep in the hole it's short i mean it was i caught it when I dove and caught it, I caught it on the other side of the infield line. You know, I was out in left center when I tracked it down. I caught it and and I jumped up and I couldn't throw anybody out, obviously, but I kept the run from scoring. You know, so then he gets out of that inning. And I don't think twice about it, but the fans in Philadelphia, because I just go out and play hard as I can play. And the fans, I don't care what the score is. And the fans in Philadelphia gave me a standing ovation when I came up with that ball. And it was dead in that stadium. And I dove for that ball and caught that ball. And, and and then he got out of the inning with no runs. So that was even better. That was just all a plus. But I think, you know, the fans appreciate the game. And as long as you're playing hard, you know, I had them tell me, oh, well, what do you think about the game now? And, and you know, I said, well, they're teaching that launch angle and all that. And I said, you know, that launch angle is not – good pitching is going to eat you alive. If you got pitchers out there, not throwers, but pitchers, you, you don't have to throw the ball 100 mile an hour to get people out. And Ray Burris said it best. Um, I was talking to him, and he said, the problem with the pitchers now, they're trying to strike everybody out. They're, they're afraid of contact. He mm -hmm. said, "He said we pitch to contact. I want you to hit the ball right now, first pitch. I want to get out of this inning with three pitches if I can, but five or something. He said, but you got to pitch to contact and make the hitters hit ground balls and do what they need to do. And he said, but everybody's trying to strike people out now. And he said, they're not pitching, they're throwing. So, you know, and it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I, you know, I, I've been, I've been saying it for a while, but coming from a major league pitcher, retired of the stature of Ray Burris, you know, I, I just, uh, you know, I heard it and it made me feel good. I was like, you're right. I said, you know, I was always told good pitching, which is the truth. It will outdo good hitting any day. If Nolan Ryan is on with his curveball, forget it. It's going to be a long day. I mean, I'll tell you a quick one about that. We had we were facing Nolan. He threw a one hitter against us. So we come he come to the clubhouse. Now I'm a rookie. So I, you know, I, I, but I'm still me, and I'm still like I, I'm a, I'm. I'm a competitor and I, you know, and so, and then I came, I played, I played up, grew up in the hood. So people talk crazy to you, you talk crazy back. But so Pete came in the clubhouse and he says, and everybody's kind of quiet and solemn. No one just threw a one hitter at one hit shutout against us. So, you know, we were, we came in humbled and come in and be quiet. And Pete comes in, he goes, how many hits you guys get today? Cause he got the only hit. And I'm like, <laughs> and no, everybody else was kind of like, uh, go on Pete, you know, but me kind of hit me wrong. 
I can't wait to get, I can't wait to say something back to him sometime. Okay. 24 years old. Remember this now. <laughs> don't really know too much. 24 years old. So you think you do, but you don't. So anyway, I think it was a couple games later and, 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 and Pete, which he did not like to do, took a 0 for 0 for 2 with two walks or something. And I think I got two hits, two for four. And and so right after the game, I came in, we won. And I came in and I said, Pete, I said, Pete, how many hits you got? <laughs> and, 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 and you know, he told me, he looked at me and he said, he said, I got more hits than anybody in the history of the game, rookie. Sit down and shut up. <laughs> I said, okay, I just shut up, didn't say another word after that. Everybody laughed. I was like, yep, that's right. I didn't, but you know, that's sad too, because I see, I saw Pete, you know, last year we went out on the field and, and I helped him back off the field. But, you know, I, I saw him um, and I, I see the way he played the game is inspirational he played that game so hard and i don't care i gotta say it out loud now right now you got uh you got sports betting gambling sponsoring major league baseball yeah i don't care if they weren't sponsoring major league baseball pete rose has more hits than anybody still in the history of this game how do you keep that out of the hall of fame that bothers me so i just had to say it out loud because i just you know Pete was a tough one sometime when we, you know, when we were playing back in those days, he's changed a lot as as he's gotten older, but you know, he was, he was a tough cookie back in those days. And I mean, he's, he's, for Christ's sake, he went, he went home plate and took out the catch in the all-star game. So, you know, (laughs) he just just played hard and that's, but that's, that's what the game is. You go play hard. And, and um, he was, he's one of a kind. And, and that's, you know, I mean, I, I had, I was so fortunate. I had guys like Gary Maddox and, and Gary Matthews Sarge and, and Bobby D and uh, lefty. And, and, you know, I just, I could go on and on and on. These guys are just good people, you know? And I mean, Greg Gross is a great guy. I mean, you know, yeah. just, just, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I can't, I, I hate to miss somebody, but we don't have but a half hour. These guys are all, <laughs> they were really good and they treated me really well. So, you know, I'm I just fortunate I was blessed to be, you know, in that situation to make it there. Two and a half years and I'm standing veteran stadium, 24 years old. So I was blessed for sure. Well, Steve, the game is a lot different now in a lot of ways. And now baseball's trying to make some other changes too. They have the pitch clock coming into effect this year. Uh, the outlaw of the shift. What do you make of these changes? I know you're not a fan of some of them. Well, you know, we had, we had, that's another one. Ray came on and talked to us about it. He, he, you know, and he's a pitcher. So I wanted to talk to him about it. Cause I don't like yeah. the idea of the clock myself. I mean, it takes it, you know, pitchers are already playing with that clock. They're all, they're already, they're already standing there for 20 seconds before the batter gets in and stepping off and then getting right back in and pitching. They're already playing the game with that clock. And I just don't think that clock needs to be in the game. There was already Ray said it best. He said that we already had a clock in the game. It's a biological clock and we had an umpire. And if you take too long, he's going to speed you up, but it's just, it was a, it's a special thing. I mean, you can't throw over, I think, but two times to first base, if there's a runner on, yeah. Um, yeah, come on. You know, you got people like Vince Coleman and Willie McGee and, I mean, <laughs> Extra and all the guys that used to run bases back when I was playing. And, uh, you know, that's – they're going to eat you alive. You can't throw over there for two times. They know you can't throw over again. So, you know, I, I don't – it doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I'm uh, – now, I, you know, I, I'll be 64 years old this year. So, you know, I'm I'm old and uh, yeah, I, I used to – I sound – I tell my kids and my – I tell them all the time. I'd say something to them. I say, "Man, I sound like my dad, and my grandpa." I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's what happens. But that 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 clock, I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't particularly care for it. Well, I can tell you, I was at the game on Sunday, uh, the spring training game, and as a fan, as you're sitting there with your buddies and you're wanting to talk in between pitches, the next pitch is coming. You're still trying to talk about the last play that happened, and the ball's coming already. You know, it, it took away from it as a fan to me. It does. Yeah. And, and you know, what I say, you know, fans, this isn't about the fans. You know, this they're, they're talking about the fans wanted to speed up the game because it's taking too long. I say, you know what? When I played, the fans are out there at the ballpark when I got there, two and a half hours before the game started. They want to see BP, and then we come off and we interact with them, take pictures with them, talk to them. It's an experience to come to the ballpark. I never saw a fan looking at his watch telling my hurry up, let's go home. Yeah, never. Right. And so, right. you know, that's part of that experience. Now that I guess they don't take infield anymore and, you know, all that kind of stuff is, I mean, infield was important because when you're on the bench, 
when the other team's taking the infield, you get to watch, look at arms, and you get to see what's the, how they're fielding balls, and you know, out in the outfield, and you can you know what you can do and get away with. Because my theory is, if you get a base hit, you don't jog down the first base line and then have a conversation with the first baseman. When you you, you get a you hit a single, you're thinking two. You hit a double, you're thinking three, and you don't stop until you make the outfielder stop you. And and so I, I'm watching all these things transpire in the game, and it's just to me, it's it's you know, I watch the the World Series, and I watched a lot of that. Um, I, I watched, I watched some pretty good baseball, um, you know, all the way through it. And but I, I watched Dusty. I played against Dusty, and in, in uh, when he was when I was in, when he was in San Francisco, when I was a player and a manager. So you know, he's playing old school baseball. And I mean, he's bunting, he's moving runners over. You know, people talk about the shift. I think Boa said it best. He came up to me at a, at a, a, I think it was a Darren Dalton function, a golf tournament. And he said, this guy came up to him and he was all irate. And he was saying, oh, that shift. I can't stand that shift. What would you guys do if they put the shift on you? And Boa looked at him and knowing, you know, I, I won't use the language he used. But he <laughs> said, I hit the ball the other way. He said, come on, really? If I'm managing and you put a shift on, Every player on my bench, especially at the major league level, better be able to hit that side of the field with the ball, period. That's yep. automatic. You're on base. And so I was doing the uh, Feeling Good show with Sean down there in Philly um, a year ago or so. I came a little over maybe. Um, and we were in a bar. Then they had it staged and that the Brett Data was there with the Darren Dalton Foundation. And, and so they they asked me the same question about that shift in it. And, and I, I told him, I said, you know what? I said, if I was playing, I said, if you couldn't hit that hole, then you need to go back to AAA or we're going to go and come in here early and work on hitting that hole. Because every time they put everybody on that side of the infield, we got a single or a double, period. As you don't just let that go. What happened to playing the game? We need base runners, and that's how you play the game. And and then he told me, he said, well, the fans want to see home runs. And I laughed at him. But I, there was a bunch of people there, probably 150 people were there, and I laughed, and I said, you know, I said, I said, you think the fans want to see home runs? I said, I played in Philadelphia. And the Philadelphia fans, I remember, they don't care if you hit any home runs if you're putting W's on the board. That's right. That's what that's they right. want to see, W's. They don't care about home runs if you're putting W's up every night. They're going to be out there. They're going to pack that stadium, and they're going to be behind you. They're not coming out there to watch you strike out six times trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. That didn't work. And Philly Amen. fans are going to let you know. <laughs> Amen. Hey, Steve, I got two more questions for you. Uh, okay. First one, uh, what is your take on the 2023 Phillies? They just you know, went to the World Series this past year. They added Trey Turner, a couple of bullpen guys. Uh, what, what do you think about this uh, year's team? You know, they're, they're a good ball club, a lot of talent. Um, I think – baseball is is it depends on all the guys at that level can play this game it's the one it's the team that plays the together the best that wins the team that hangs out in the clubhouse after the game the team that comes early and has their headphones out of their ear and they're not sitting in the corner but interacting before the game and i think the phillies have a good chance because they have that edge. They talk to each other. They communicate with each other. I think they're going to be a very good ball club. And I know the people that get, that got them in there. And, you know, Rob Holiday, I talked to him, you know, quite a bit. I haven't talked to him in a while. But, you know, I talked to a lot of these people out there. And, and you know, Philly baseball is something different. And they demand a, a, a certain standard. Uh, and, and, you know, I know with the way times have changed and the game has changed, you know, that has somewhat changed as well. But the core of it all could be, I'll tell you why, because of you guys, because of the fans of Philadelphia, they stay on point. That organization stays on point. They know what you want and they know what they want. And they, you don't let them forget it. That's the bottom line. You know, some cities, some towns, you know, the team's not doing well or something like that. You know, it's just you don't talk about it. They don't really. But you guys, you keep everybody on point. I love it. I, that's why I'm back. I love it because it's like it's what's real. You come out here, they pay an a arm and a leg to go watch a ball game, and they don't get to watch batting practice. They don't get to watch any of that. So when they go out there, let's give them a good baseball game anyway. Let's have some fun with it. And I think the organization has set this up and, and they're bringing people together that can play well together. And that's the best part of it. You win games in the clubhouse. You know, a manager's job is camaraderie. A manager's job is the chemistry in the clubhouse. That's his job. Everybody, when they get there, can play. 
So he puts the lineup card out and lets them get keeps them together and lets them understand their roles as individual players. That's the most important thing. Bill, I got one more question I got to ask Steve. You can't okay. believe everything you read on the internet, even on Wikipedia, but it says on Wikipedia that after your playing career, you worked as a bail bondsman and a bounty <laughs> hunter for a while. Is that true? That is the truth. <laughs> I did that for a year. Um, I lost my brother um, right after the, my my 90 season with the Royals um, suicide. And, and um, that was my older brother. I was telling him he was the first Bo Jackson. Yeah. He was he was my mentor. So, you know, and then, you know, I had some problems marriage wise, you know, like a lot of guys do when you play, finish playing your home too much. So, you know, that's one of those things. So um, that was within two months of me retiring. I retired from baseball, had a problem with marriage and I lost my brother. And a friend of mine's dad called my dad. And I grew up with him and, you know, he kind of easy had some problems in his life or what have you, but I hadn't talked to him in years, but his dad and I were a really good friend. Still, he lived out in Arizona at the time. He called my dad and said his son was in jail and he had twin girls. And he wanted him out for Christmas. So he mm -hmm. said, I can't send it. He said, he said, if you could just call Steve Bill and, and, and uh, he said, I'll send this money. It's $500 if he'll co-sign that bond for him and get him out so he can be with his kids on Christmas. And so he said, I can't call any of his other friends because it'll never get there. But I said, okay. I said, so dad asked me and I called him and he sent and I got him out. Long story short, the, how I became a bail bondsman and bounty hunting because they called me up and said he didn't make it to court. And mm -hmm. I said, I went down to the office, so now they want that $5,000. I just retired from baseball. It's not like I'm trying to pay. I said, so what do I have to do to get past it? Well, you got two weeks if you can get him in here, but we've been looking for him for six weeks. I said, why didn't you call me sooner? So four hours later, long story short, I went up to Olathe, Kansas, found him, brought him back, and I heard the story, da, 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 and I didn't want to hear it. As I told you, I didn't have the money. I told you I'd come and get you. And you can you hiding from them, but I can find you. So I brought him back to the office and then I said, okay, am I good? Do I have to pay this 5,000? He said, no, no, you're good. Thank you. I don't know how you did that in four hours. And so <laughs> I got ready to leave and he stopped me and he said, could you wait a minute? And I said, what's that? He said, well, he ran on me once before. And I was like, oh. I said, yeah, I'll ride down to jail with you. So I rode down with him. And when he got out of the car, it's funny. When he got out of the car, I seen that look in his eye to go into that jail. I see it look in his eye like he wanted to run. And I just looked at him and said, oh, I wish you would. I said, I said, I got world class speed. You, I wish you would. He just dropped his shoulders and he went in. And then he asked me to be uh, uh, the owner after we took him. He gave me a ride back and and he said, he said, well, I, I, could you could you uh, bounty hunt for me? And you know that's something that was way out there. And I'm like, what bounty hunt for you? And so I, I went home and asked my dad. Of course, I said, what do you think about that? And he said, well, son, he said. I made it a, a point in my life to never take anything I can't give back. Well, you know, then my wheels start turning. And so I said, okay. So I walked in the office and I said, if you make me an officer of court so I can get people out of jail, then I'll do it for you. And I said, there's no stipulation on how much the bond is. It doesn't matter if I'm going to do this for you. So the no-show rate went from, I, I think he told me it was 42% or something out of there. In that year I was there, it went down to 2%. Cause I used to pick them up and have conversations with them. And I went to the grocery store with some of these kids that, you know, had kids at home and he's out acting the fool. And then we have a conversation and I buy them groceries and tell him, now you call me, don't miss this court date with my name on it. So that's how I got into that. And, and it was more helping people than anything. I, I tried to do that. I put myself in a position that I could talk to them. And when they're going to go to jail or listen to you, they pretty much listen to you most of the time. So, you know, I bond them back out and, and, and then they'd make it to court and, you know, the judges were real happy with it and it, it worked out well. So you don't have to be mean. I, I think respecting people is the most important thing about that. You know, the, the jail told me one time when I was bringing them in all the time, and he said, he said, Steve, you need to start cuffing these guys up before you bring them to that door. And I said, why? I said, as soon as I come through the door, you take them off. He said, well, you never know what these people are going to do. I said, oh, I know what they're going to do. I said, I'm not worried about that. So I just get, even though you, maybe you missed a court date or you missed something I, you know, I try to give you the benefit of the doubt between me and you. Now you get that one chance. You're honest with me and you try to do the right thing. I'm going to keep helping you. So that's what I tried to do. All right. Hey, Steve, we have two minutes uh, okay. and we got to run. Uh, I wanted to ask you and not let you get away on this. Uh, you're trying to do some stuff with some youth sports out there in central Pennsylvania. Uh, can you give us the, the quick version of what you got going on? Yes, sir. We, we put together an organization called 
Primal Sports and Primal Sports Charities. And it's to advocate for young people, men, uh, girls and boys. We have softball, baseball, football. I mean, we're trying to put the facility together, $45 million project um, at this point. But we have it all set up now. So, you know, any help is great. We're, we advocate for the kids. Um, Special Olympics, I want to office in our building. Um, we're just trying to do some things for the children. And we have mental health counseling, um, uh, physical therapy. Uh, so we're doing a lot to an education program uh, with tutors and all that. So that's what we're trying to do. And it's, you know, it's going to take some time, uh, but we got the right idea. And so anybody wants to try and help out primal sports, that would be fantastic because we got a mission. And that's uh, central Pennsylvania, Carlisle area. Yes, sir. Is there a, is there a website or somewhere? There is. Look primal, that up? Yes. It's primal sports, uh, primal sports and primal sports charities. Okay. Fantastic. So thank Steve. you very much. Yeah, man. Thank, thanks for joining us. Uh, time flew by, but let's do this again. Absolutely. Anytime. You guys have a blessed night. All right. You yeah, too. we're going to have you back this summer. You can talk more about that and about the uh, podcast that you're doing these days. All right. Absolutely. I'll be All right. My thanks, pleasure. Steve. Thank you very much, talk guys. You See you later. Okay. Right. Take care. Thanks, Steve. All right. All right. Hey, Chad, spring is just around the corner, but you can still save some money with Allstate's pay as you go auto insurance. Yeah, that's right, Bill. Allstate's pay-as-you-go auto insurance puts you in control. You only pay for the miles you drive with the same full coverage that a traditional policy offers. Pay-for-mile insurance gives customers greater control of their insurance costs. See how much you can save with pay-for-mile car insurance by calling your local agent. In Westchester, Pennsylvania, that's Dave Lavoy. Call Dave at 610-430-0700. Again, 610-430-0700. And start to save more now that you are driving less. Very good. Hey, tell us what's going Why we got you. Tell us what's going on over at the Irish Rover Station House. Well, you know, a little leprechaun told me that this is a big week for the Irish Rover Station House. <laughs> I mean, they have things going on all the time. It's quiz night every Wednesday, and they have live music all the time. And they have coming up Thursday evening this week, Guinness Night. Of course, it's also St. Patrick's Day Eve, so you know the Guinness is going to be flowing. But they also have all week long all sorts of Irish favorites on the menu, including shepherd's pie, corned beef and cabbage, Guinness stew, a ham platter. And on St. Paddy's Day itself on Friday, well, it is just nonstop fun. Live music most of the afternoon and evening. Irish dancers, still those great food specials. And you know that the Guinness will be flowing really a lot on Friday. The Irish Rover is the place to be always, but especially over the next several days. And you can get more details on all of that on their website, Irish Rover Station House dot com. Hi, football fans. This is Merrill Reese, and you're listening to Bill and Chet on Philly Press Box Radio. It's good. Well, I don't know if NFL free agency has been good or not for Merle, but uh, it opened Monday afternoon. It was a feeding frenzy chat around the league. The Eagles, as expected, get hit hard on the defensive side of the ball. Um, I'm, You know, I guess it's the price you pay for being in the Super Bowl and having all those guys make all pro. They all got paid. Uh, Good for them. For the Eagles, it's 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 a rebuild on the defensive side now for sure. Yeah, but you know what? They haven't lost as many guys as we thought that they would. Uh, Yeah, Darius Slay's gone. They ended up cutting him. But James Bradbury is coming back. That's kind of unexpected. Nobody expected that. Uh, And they say he took a little bit of a hometown discount. What, three years, $28 million? Boy, the money is just crazy these days. Uh, Hargrave left, but uh, Fletcher Cox is sticking around. One year, $10 million. Some people say, ah, that's still too much for him. But you know what? He had a decent year this past year, seven and a half sacks. So he can, you know, help them for another year. And we already know that Brandon Graham is sticking around also for a year. So it could have been worse. Yeah, they lost Hargrave, TJ Edwards, and Marcus Epps from the defensive side, and now Slay also. Uh, still no word on CJ, DJ, BJ. Right. <laughs> I can right. never get those initials right. Gardner Johnson. Yeah, him. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, and and it's it's time for some other guys, the Kobe Dean Davis. Time for these yeah. guys. They also lost because you're white, uh, so they have no yes. linebackers uh, yeah. right at this point. But um, you know, it's still interesting. Like you said, there's guys still out there. Gardner Johnson being one, Miles Sanders being one. Uh, there, Miles Sanders said goodbye, but they didn't 
get anybody to take his spot. Um, Penny's yeah, well, not they, taking they picked up one guy who's you know yeah, he's he's not taking Miles Sanders' job. No, for sure. But we're so, going to see more of Kenny Gainwell, I think, and I'm sure they're going to draft a running back in maybe the third round. Well, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, it just depends how it plays. Is it, you know, signing a guy like Cox and and Graham, uh, you know, they had to go get the Dominican Sue. So Fletcher Cox fills the, the Dominican Sue role maybe next year. You know, it's everybody's got to fill a role here. So it, it's not earth shaking to me exactly uh, yet what happened. Uh, what really is surprising to me is offensive tackles get ninety million. Hundred million, eighty million oh, yeah. dollar deals. Uh crazy stuff going on out there. And and it's not over. It's gonna be a lot more. Yeah, we know say Amala was probably gonna leave. And they're talking about maybe putting Cam Jurgens in a uh, guard since Kelsey's coming back. So we'll see how that goes. And you know, a lot of things can happen still between now and the summer. I mean, remember last year they didn't get Bradbury till late. Uh they didn't get Gardner Johnson until later in the summer. So there's still a lot of moves to be made. So we'll see how it all plays out. Uh, how he's going to work his magic as best he can, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of getting the cap number down so they could start adding players. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, I certainly don't tend to understand what all that cap business is and dead money and all that kind of crazy stuff. But uh, how he's good at it. So we'll, we'll see how it plays out. I think. I'm not I'm not too awful concerned about it. One thing I am a little concerned about, and I don't like these guys, the Giants have gotten better. Yeah. And they got you a know. good coach now, so you know. Yeah, I mean that, that I don't like the Giants being better. Cowboys said goodbye to Ezekiel Elliott in a bit of a surprise to me. I don't know if that was expected, but uh Yeah, I think I it was. He again, he's another guy who was just making too much money. And oh, yeah. and you know, and now he's a backup or he was a backup to Pollard yeah. last year. So uh Plenty more to come on the on the football front. Uh, we'll see, and and you know, and of course, buried down in there, Jalen Hurts has to get paid. So, yeah, that's still uh, going to happen in the next few weeks. Um, yeah, and how that? By the way, yeah. I was out at the Birds Town Hall, WIP does every year at about this time, and I had a brief chat with this guy, Merrill, our our buddy Merrill Reese, and uh, always good to see Merrill. He's you know. Still got it, and he's. I heard him talking to somebody there. He said he's never retiring. He just loves what he does, and we love listening to him. So, yeah, it's way to go, absolutely, Carol. absolutely, we do. It's uh, going to be a fun football season, I think, and and a lot, a lot of quarterbacks changing, changing teams too. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, if uh, uh, Aaron Rodgers goes to the Jets, as it seems like he's going to, Jalen Hurts may be the best quarterback in the NFC. If he's he might not be the best, he might be the best quarterback without Aaron Rodgers. Aaron overrated well, Rodgers. Yeah, that, that is true. Yeah. Aaron overrated Rodgers, by the way. <laughs> you heard it here first. I if know. you if you didn't hear from somebody else, you heard it here. <laughs> All right. Hey, real quick, um, before we move on to our edge of Philly, you're going to you're coming to Florida tomorrow. You go spend a little time, go see the Phillies. Let's tell us about yep. that trip. Flying out tomorrow morning into Tampa. Uh, flying Frontier Airlines, so that could be an adventure. You just never know. Uh, hopefully, everything will be on time and uh, not canceled or whatever. Looks like good weather uh, both ways tomorrow, so hopefully no problems. Seeing a friend of mine in Tampa late afternoon and evening, and then uh, I'll be in Clearwater all day on Friday, including the Phillies game. So that'll be fun. It's St. Patrick's Day, and there's going to be probably some beer involved. I'll see some they more selling, friends. They were selling then, that uh, Sunday, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a fun weekend. Yeah, even if the weather is not great Saturday and Sunday, uh, it'll be fun. Yeah. Well, the last I looked, they were pushing that weather out a little bit. Uh, it's going to rain one of those days, but it was supposed to be a whole wet weekend. And it's, yeah. it looks like it might be pushing a little bit. So have fun. I'm sorry I'm not going to be able to get to see you. I got yeah. an obligation uh, of work. What, what can I do? I'll, I'll get by, Bill. I'll be okay. Don't worry. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know about leaving you down here by yourself. Hey, <laughs> let's go ahead and give a shout out to our shows at the Edge of Philly Sports Network this week. Football season ended, but that, that hasn't slowed down. Things are picking back up. A lot of baseball going on, baseball talk. Catch all the action on www.eopsports.com as well as Edge of Philly Sports on YouTube. You can find our show on Philly Press Box Radio YouTube channel as well. Please help us out by hitting those subscribe, follow, and like buttons. And as always, 
share with your family and friends. Well, hey, Chet, uh, speaking of a St. Patrick's Day party, uh, Friday is St. Patrick's Day. There's uh, going to be a little party going on at Dolan's Pub deep down in the heart of Delco, I hear. Yeah, it looks like a great time at Dolan's. I wish I could be there. I mean, except that I'm going to be having fun down in Florida. But uh, it is the annual St. Patrick's Day event at Dolan's in Ridley Park. And my buddy Brent Porch is going to be there. Brent is on WMMR every afternoon from 3 to 7. And he's become a friend over the years. In fact, I exchanged texts with him this afternoon. I said I wish I could be there because I love hanging out with Brent. But I'll be in Florida. He understands. Preston and Steve from MMR will be down there. But anyway, at Dolan's, they will have live music all day. They have drink specials. They have food vendors there. So it's going to be a good time. St. Patrick's Day at Dolan's in Ridley Park. That is 24 East Sellers Avenue. Check them out, dolansbar.com. Absolutely. Fun place. Hey, Chet, uh, who thought we'd be talking Penn State hoops in March? Go figure. The Nittany Lions are the 10 seed in the Midwest. They're playing the 7 seed, Texas A&M Aggies. Um, a nice run by Penn State there at the end of the season to uh, get them to the dance. Look, I'm not going to tell you that I'm a hoops expert in terms of Penn State or college basketball at all, but I did watch some of their impressive Big Ten tournament run. They're a good team, uh, and they have one of the 10 best players in the country in senior guard Jalen Pickett, who's averaging 18, 7, and 7. He's really good. Swingman Seth Lundy also has had a real good season. They're a two-and-a-half-point underdog against a and but I know a lot of people are picking them to win that game outright so i'm biased i'm taking psu to at least win that round one game and then they would likely meet second seed texas on saturday in the second round right who's gonna win the whole thing i have no idea i, I filled out a bracket i took houston just because they're one of the favorites but i, I don't want you close enough to make a, an educated guess so i'll just go with one of the favorites houston and see what happens uh, whoop there's a text jet miles sanders to the panthers Ah, so, how about that? Huh. Yeah, well, we, we had a hunch he was leaving. So, Miles, thank you I for four great yeah. years in Philly. Uh, yeah, he had a pretty good season, too. They're going to miss him, but we wish him well. I was hoping he was coming back. Darn. Yeah. I was hoping they were going to be able to sneak him back in there. By the way, I'm going UCLA. Okay. All right. Hey, but speaking of hoops, the Sixers have turned up the juice, Chet. They've won five in a row again. They're in third place, three and a half games behind Milwaukee, but just one game behind Boston for that second spot. Uh, Milwaukee's been on fire, but maybe that second spot's attainable. Yeah, they're on a roll for sure, although they've had to make big comebacks in a couple of those games that they won recently. They're playing the Cavs in Cleveland as we speak, the sort of a two-week period where they play seven of eight on the road. So that, that's not easy. Cleveland tonight, a big one for sure. Then they are down in New Orleans on Friday. That's a winnable game. And, oh, by the way, Bill, another Eastern Conference Player of the Week award for Joel Embiid. Yeah, he's playing pretty good ball, isn't he? He is. He's in the lineup every night playing well, and Harden's playing great. So I like their chances. Let me put up the standings again, see where we are. I think they're now four back in Milwaukee because the Bucks pulled one out last night. But, yeah, they're just a game behind the Celtics for the second seed, and they're even in the loss column with the Celtics. So I mentioned they're just ahead of the Cavaliers, so that is a big one tonight. You win this one tonight, that puts more distance between yourselves and the fourth-seeded Cavaliers. The Nets, meanwhile, just continue to fade, so uh, they're not a threat at all. Yeah, so 67 games in, so that means there's 15 of them left. They're coming down yeah. the home stretch. They're playing good. they got to stay healthy. Um the 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 Embiid Harden combination with Maxi in there is pretty darn good. Uh, again, go back to the same thing we've been talking about all along: is do they have the depth to be able to make this thing happen? And uh, yeah. if it was three on three, I, I'd like their chances. <laughs> but uh, do they have yeah. the depth? Yeah, the depth to be able you to just never know. Play? I mean, some some nights they're good, some nights they're not. The Niangs and the other guys coming off the bench. So I'd like to see more consistency there. But they got 15 games to get it together. And, uh, you know, it, it all comes down to the playoffs. Can they get past the second round? If not, we'll be talking about firing Doc Rivers again. Well, we can <laughs> do that anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, hey, great guest tonight. It's Steve Jeltz. Who is coming to Philly Press Box Radio next Wednesday? 
Yeah, that was fun talking with uh, Jeltsy. He's a good guy. He loves to talk. Uh, next week, Bill, we have our annual visit from a Philly icon. You know him from WIP the past, uh, what is it, 28 or 29 years now. He's on there pretty much every Saturday and Sunday. Plus, he's on Eagles pregame shows. It's Glenn Mack now. I saw him today at uh, McGurk's in Horsham also. Also, it's, you know, it's always great to talk with the prof. And so you know, Bill, I will very, very likely hit Glenn Mack now with a question or two about beer. Yeah, why not? Why not? Because, he, yeah, he does the What's Brewing show on uh, NBC Sports Philly, and I, I catch that whenever I can, learn some good tips about beers and find some new places to go and new beers to sample. Yeah, he uh, he knows a little bit about it. He does. All right. So now we have to talk about the Flyers, yet because – Fortunately, we overran with the, with uh, Jelty, so we don't have as much time to talk about the Flyers. Thank goodness for that, huh? It's been a miserable second half of the season. Danny Briere is the new interim GM. I don't know if that matters or not. Uh, word around town is everyone that won't be in their prime when the rebuild is complete is available for trade, including Carter Hart. Uh, that you know, I don't know how long they expect that to be, but. Uh, do you have to do you have to get rid of the little bit of good you have to really hit rock bottom to start this thing over again? Oh yeah, it's got to be crazy cuz I don't know what to expect from Briere. I don't know how much authority they're giving him and uh you know how many moves he's going to be allowed to make, but we like Danny, so you know hopefully he will get a chance to make some moves because they got to figure this out. Uh it's time to make something happen. Something do something different because what they've been doing in recent years just hasn't worked. And then, of course, today we get the news that his son got into a little trouble and had to apologize for doing something stupid. So Because uh, he, he got yeah. caught. Because he got caught. He got caught and had to apologize. Yeah. yeah. Didn't get yeah. caught, he wouldn't have apologized. Exactly. Uh, but anyway, like I said at the top of the show, I wish Danny luck. And uh, I don't, I don't want to see them trade Carter Hart. But, man, they got to get him some help if they're going to keep him. Yeah, I mean, you can't. He can continue to play good hockey for the next three years, and if he is nineteen and twenty-five every year because they can't score goals in front of him, then what? What have you accomplished? Yeah, uh, I, I don't know what else to say about the Flyers anymore, Bill. I really don't. Yeah, well, the only <laughs> thing I can hope is that they they real that the hockey people in the organization realize. We got to fix this thing, and maybe ownership gets on board that we got to fix this thing because you talk about a team that has really lost the city, and, and you know so many diehard Flyer fans that would go through anything with this team, and they aren't doing it anymore. Yeah. So as you said, the off season can't get here soon enough for the Flyers, Bill. That, that's right. Hey, well, I wanted to mention that when I'm in Clearwater tomorrow, I'm going to say hello to some of the guys from Philly Sports Trips because they have some things going on there uh, down there this week with Charlie Manuel doing a thing tomorrow. And they have some other things coming up, a bus trip to Yankee Stadium. They're going out to Kansas City for the draft. They have a couple of union events. And, boy, they're just busy all summer long. They're going to Wrigley Field. They're going to see the union over in London and Leeds. You can go to... Uh, Denver also for both baseball and the union. So get all the details on that on their website. That is phillysportstrips.com. Yeah, and I, I saw them in their Philly Sports Trip shirts uh, Sunday that uh, that Hollis Thomas was there. He's, he's a pretty big human being, by the way. Uh, he's a large man. <laughs> he's a large man. But, yeah, that, I saw them at uh, the game on Sunday. Didn't get a chance to talk to them. But uh, I didn't know you were going to throw that Philly sports trip in because that was the 30 seconds you had to talk about the Academy Awards. So you you messed up on that. Sorry. Uh, yeah. How much uh, the show did you watch? All three hours and 38 you're, minutes? You're done. Thanks. Let's take another <laughs> quick break and thank our friends at the PPCC 118 Raz Room. They post great sports memorabilia on their Facebook page so people can take a chance of winning something they may not be able to afford or have access to. All items come with certificates of authenticity. They continue to run out great autograph memorabilia from all the Philly teams and more. Check out their Facebook page. Like it or follow it. It's PPCC 118 Raz Room. That's right. PPCC 118 Raz Room on Facebook. How did we somehow get ahead of schedule now? How did that happen? Because we flew through the everything but Steve Jeltz. 
I, and I couldn't take any more of the Flyers talk. I, I just couldn't, Bill. I, I knew you couldn't, and we weren't <laughs> going to talk about the Academy Awards. So, uh, but hey, you you got somebody right there. Hey, you got a fan. Joel wow, Ross, Ross, he really thirty-eight. Yeah, Joe apologized to you uh, for watching because he made some comments on some of the films. So Joe's a good man, Bill. Yeah, yeah. Well, he was until now. Now we got to start questioning, you know, some <laughs> other things. But we'll talk to Joe about that in private. You know, let me just say this about the movie. The movie that won the best picture, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, it was one of those kind of polarizing films. A lot of people loved it, but a lot of people hated it, said it was actually – not real good. I gave it a B minus, but I did not love it. I'm a generous grader. So watch it. It's kind of weird. A, a sci-fi metaverse, part comedy, part I don't know what. I did not love it. really have my attention with that. Hey, uh, speaking of baseball, have you watched the uh, the World Games, whatever they're calling this thing with the Phillies? World baseball uh, Classic. I have not, but I know Schwarber hit a homer over the weekend. Did he? Well, I saw where they didn't have him in any of them in the lineup uh, on one of the games, any of the three Phillies. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what kind of reception it's getting. Uh, but for me personally, not one bit of interest. I don't I don't know why. Maybe because yeah. it's spring training. I'm really more interested in watching the Phillies. Speaking of the Phillies, uh, Andrew Painter, we haven't really heard anything more than we heard on Monday that, you know, three or four weeks of rest, four weeks from the actual injury, and then start throwing again. So, you know, obviously he's not going to be in the opening week rotation, but, uh, you know, I just hope they're doing the right thing with him and not rushing him back. It sounds like they're going to be very cautious with him, but, you know, if he doesn't get to pitch this May or June, it's not the end of the world. He's 19. Get him healthy and you know, start the process again later this summer or next year. Yeah, and I think that's exactly what they'll do. I think they'll be really careful with him. Uh, and the the schedule is always light at the beginning of the year, a lot of off days. They don't really need a fifth guy or a full-time fifth guy. Um, I'm not sure Bailey Falter is that guy. I watched him Sunday. He got hit around a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's spring training, so – that is what it is. They gave up 15 runs to the Braves yesterday. And if you look at the box score, there's probably not one guy that gave up runs that you that you know. So well, that's good. <laughs> you can't get you can't get caught in the uh all that all the scores and and all that. This how are guys throwing and how are guys hitting and the guys that um look like they're gonna be the rotation are all throwing the ball pretty well so far. Hey, I saw that you uh, did see our buddy Carl Henderson down there last weekend. Is he still down there? He is. Uh, he'll be here till Sunday. So he, yeah, he got here. I think Sunday or Monday, maybe Monday. But yeah, well, Carl will be at the game on Friday. I will look for Carl, and I'll look for Robbie Ellis and her husband Bob. Robbie, yep, absolutely. And uh, Sean, uh, who's a friend of Carl's, who I've met through Carl's, getting married tomorrow in, on Clearwater Beach. So congratulations wow. to Sean and his bride they were they were both at the game so saw a bunch nice. of people adam Ujessic, my friends here in lakeland who are from uh beautiful clifton heights pennsylvania lives in lakeland now him and his wife were there so we had a good time and uh go just going to clearwater and hanging out with the people is is a good thing in its own self as you know i can't wait to get back the last time i was there was three years ago and we know what happened it was right when the uh, the world kind of ended March twelfth and thirteenth. <laughs> you were not. You and I were on the doorstep of uh, the stadium when they said there's no game today. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we hope for a better, uh, better weekend this time around. So That's wrap right. it up, Bill. I'm done. All right, let's do it. Like, let's thank tonight's special guest, Steve Jeltz, our sponsors, the Irish Rover Station House, Bob Sullivan's Like Your Age dot com, PPCC one eighteen Raz Room, and Dave Lavoy of Allstate Insurance in Westchester, PA. For Jim Chechesko, this is Bill Furman. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'll join Philly Press Box Radio next Wednesday, March 22nd at 7 p.m. You see us live on Facebook. Listen to our website, phillypressboxradio.com, on Google Podcasts, as well as Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and all the others. High hopes, Philadelphia sports fans. High hopes, Indiana. High